Hello, this video is from session 9 and 10 and it specifically looks at the growth trap, a two sector model. I will do a separate video for the poverty trap, which is where we assume that population growth is endogenous with respect to income. For now though, the growth trap is known also as a two sector model and it essentially combines elements of both neoclassical growth theory as well as endogenous growth theory. On the horizontal axis, we're measuring capital stock per person. On the vertical axis, we're measuring output per person. So as before, with both neoclassical growth theory and endogenous growth theory, we're looking to try and understand the links between how capital stock per person increases and then how output per person increases. You'll notice that the shape of the investment requirement line is as it was with both neoclassical growth theory and with endogenous growth theory. It's a straight line and that indicates that the amount of investment required in an economy is related to the population growth rate and the depreciation rate of capital. As the capital to labor ratio increases, the amount of investment per person required increases to maintain the capital to labor ratio and specifically that investment requirement line is recognizing that we need additional investment to offset the effects of an increasing population as well as the depreciation rate of capital. What's quite different from this model is that both the shape of the production function and the shape of the related savings function don't look either like the neoclassical growth theory alone or like the endogenous growth theory alone. Essentially, the growth trap model combines elements of both sorts of models, recognizing that when countries are um, initially in their growth phase, they might start out investing in physical capital stock. And if they start out investing in um, physical capital stock, that investment opportunity is characterized by diminishing marginal returns. So you'll see that initially the shape of the production function is as it was with neoclassical growth theory. It is concave initially, and this illustrates that initially, as an economy starts to increase its capital stock per person, output per person increases at a decreasing rate. So the first type of investment opportunity is then in physical capital stock. And that's why initially the production function takes on the shape like in the neoclassical growth theory where the production function exhibits diminishing marginal returns. As capital stock per person increases, output per person increases at a decreasing rate. Linked to that, the initial part of the savings function also has a concave shape because it follows the shape of the production function. So as capital per person increases, output per person increases at a decreasing rate. The economy saves a constant portion of the output per person, which is increasing at a decreasing rate. And so savings per person also increases at a decreasing rate. The second sort of investment opportunity is related to the fact that as economies expand and get bigger, they'll move away from purely looking or investing in physical capital stock, but also start to invest in knowledge capital. And if you recall from the discussion of endogenous growth theory, with endogenous growth theory, we're assuming that the bulk of the investment which takes place in an economy, specifically as an economy gets bigger, is going to be in knowledge capital more than in physical capital stock. In addition, we recognize that with knowledge capital, the production function will no longer exhibit diminishing marginal returns, but rather it will exhibit constant returns. If that's the case, that's where we see here the production function now moving to take a more positive mm -hmm. slope. Okay? It's difficult to draw, so apologies if my line looks a bit wonky, but from essentially about here, that's where we have the endogenous growth theory part of the production function. Similarly then, the savings function follows the shape of the production function, and so the savings function also then follows a constant slope for the part of the model which is looking specifically at endogenous growth theory. 
So the Growth Chapel 2 sector model combines two types of investment opportunities, physical capital stock where there are diminishing marginal returns, and knowledge capital where there are constant returns. This is called a two-sector model because it combines elements of both neoclassical growth theory as well as endogenous growth theory. But also, this model is sometimes known as the growth trap. And let's see how that would work. Initially, in this economy, assume that it starts off at a level of capital stock below a steady state equilibrium. So a capital stock would grow per person because savings would exceed investment required. So all everywhere over here, savings per person is greater than the investment required to maintain these different capital to labor ratios. So capital per person can increase and output per person can increase. Until eventually there is a steady state which is reached. And that steady state is reached at say Ka and a level of output per person Ya. All right. And let's call that steady state equilibrium A. Remember that a steady state equilibrium is where the amount of capital stock per person and the amount of output per person will no longer change. Essentially, the growth rate in capital per person and the growth rate in output per person remain constant. The next steady state equilibrium is over here. Because at that point, it's once again where savings per person and investment per person are equal to each other. So we can call that KB. And we can mark off the level of output per person. Okay, And this is again, once, a state is, once again, a steady state equilibrium because capital stock per person equals output per person. Capital stock per person, sorry and output per person will not change once that steady state equilibrium has been reached. But note that it's going to be quite difficult for an economy to move from being at a steady state equilibrium such as at A to the steady state equilibrium at B or beyond that. And this is because if we look at what's happening between those two steady states, between those two steady states, investment required exceeds the amount of savings being generated. And so, in an economy which starts out relatively poor, and which is investing in physical capital stock, even if they were to increase their capital to labor ratios slightly more than Ka, that would not be sustainable because when their capital to labor ratio exceeds K star A, or Ka, but is less than KB, investment required exceeds savings. So the economy will not be able to sustain higher to capital to labor ratios in this region, and the economy would move back to the steady state equilibrium at point A, and output per person would eventually move back to point A. It's only once the economy has been able to reach a capital to labor ratio which is in excess of K star B that then they would be able to experience ongoing economic growth, and in particular, economic growth which is endogenous. If you consider what's happening beyond the capital to labor ratio of K star B, everywhere beyond K star B, the savings function exceeds the investment function. This is where savings will always be bigger than investment required, and if savings is always bigger than investment required, then output per person will continue to be able to increase. So the reason why we then call this model the growth trap is because essentially it is very, very difficult for young economies or for poor economies to move beyond a steady state equilibrium such as point A. They become stuck in a growth trap because it's difficult for them to raise enough funds to be able to push their economy past a point such as B, where after that point, they would always have sufficient savings to meet their investment required. Essentially, point A is what we would call a stable equilibrium because the economy moves towards it. Point B is an unstable equilibrium. To the left of point B, the economy would move back to point A. 
and to the right of point B, the economy would carry on improving in terms of its capital per person and output per person. So point A is a stable equilibrium, point B is an unstable equilibrium. It's very difficult for economies to move out of the growth trap associated by a steady state equilibrium such as A, which occurs at a relatively low level of output per person, because of the fact that a very big increase in um, investment and savings would be needed to move the economy past the steady state equilibrium at B, which is where it would need to be to ensure that continuous economic growth could happen. So many economies become stuck in a growth trap under these sorts of conditions. They start off um, growing their economies with physical capital stock, and it's very difficult to make the leap and transition into a knowledge-based capital economy, which is where most of the growth would then be able to happen.